um, you know, and, and there's a little blurb and we'll share this, this slide deck with folks, um, you know, the, at least the bio, so you know what folks look like and, and how to get in touch with them. Um, with that, Rafi, do you want to maybe begin by sharing a little bit about your background and what inspired you to, to, uh, to, to join Booth? Sure. So I was uh, a lawyer by training and I practiced law for about six years. And then I worked, I took a job at uh, Thomson Reuters and uh, they are the largest company in Canada and they are the largest vendor to lawyers. And I sold for Thomson Reuters for about nine years, 10 years. And I, and I had great success. I was um, I was going to President's Club every year. Um, management loved me. Um, I, they were doing some really neat things. And, and uh, I was not only posting big numbers because I was in sales. I was selling to lawyers, but I was helping management and product management with new products. And it was a really exciting time in my life. And I thought that I would retire as a, uh, you know, a senior vice president of sales or, or perhaps even run Thomson Reuters uh, one day. That was, that was my dream. And I loved the company. I thought, you know, I was going to get license plates that said uh, market, or market JD, Thomson Reuters or Westlaw, which is what I was selling. So um, I, I talked to senior management and they agreed to fund a, a portion of my MBA um, and I, I thought that the, the Booth MBA would be my ticket into upper management at Thomson Reuters. That was what was my motivation for it. And can you walk us through, I know that why, between when you started and when you ended, you know, with, with your personal life, with, with your work especially, and, and as Mike alluded to, right, we had, you know, the economy went off a cliff, right? The fundamentals of the economy changed, right? And, and, and how, did, how did that impact you? And maybe some of your classmates, if you, if you can share a little bit about that. Yeah, right. Because um, my background is pretty unusual um, in my class. And as I imagine in your classes, you probably don't have many lawyers who are salespeople. Um, we had a lot of finance people. We had a lot of consultants, investment bankers. And um, as the program went on, uh, the economy began to sour. And um, what started out as, as great economic conditions quickly deteriorated. Um, and so, you know, if I had any thoughts of going into investment banking or consulting, those quickly evaporated during this crisis. Um, and everyone was losing their job. Um, and the, the economics behind what I was selling completely fell apart. Law firms were no longer able to afford the large packages we were selling. They could no longer pass it on to their clients. Um, and everyone was cutting corners and everyone was cutting jobs. And, uh, and I was one of those casualties. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a complete eye opener. It was a total shock to me. Um, literally three weeks before graduation, I lost, I lost my job. And um, by that time, a lot of us, the, the, the blood had been let and many of us were without jobs. And, and, and you know, I, and, I, and I sense, you know, um, in my conversations with Peter uh, and, and some of the other XP, XP89s and even some XP88s that were hoping to pivot to a new career, a new area. So I, I, I sense that, uh, I sense that uh, I'm gonna say sense of trepidation that may it, despair for, for lack of a better word, you know, as you went through your journey, you know, how did you come up with this decision? Because, you know, from what you're describing, you had a young family, three kids, all you had was your savings. What caused you to pivot, right? Like you identified an opportunity, right? You kind of said, this is what I want to do, right? At what point did you say, I'm not going to go back into the job market and I have these tools. So what helped you kind of catalyze for lack of a better term, what was the catalyst that brought you to that decision? Yeah, so um, as, as Mike mentioned, uh, I have three kids and at the time all of them were, my oldest was six, my middle was four and I had a newborn. Um, my fixed costs were probably between private school tuition and mortgage. I was probably paying fixed costs around $70,000 a year. Um, I had gone from an income of, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year to zero, like overnight, except for my my meager unemployment check. 
And uh, so when I first graduated, um, actually even before that, I remember, uh, I remember when we were going through the graduation rituals, um, there were all sorts of dinners. And I remember there was one of our classmates owned, his family owned a bread company in Chicago and they were fantastically wealthy and they didn't need to really worry about uh, paying their bills. And, um, and that graduate organized a dinner for us. Um, and it wasn't an extraordinarily expensive dinner, but it was, it was uh, you know, a $50 meal. And I remember telling them that I wanted to come, but I, I, I didn't want to buy the dinner because I was literally so scared that I wasn't going to be able to pay my bills. Um, and uh, I remember taking a call during that dinner and just, I can't express to you how sad I was that, that here I am, I, I did everything right. I, I hit all my milestones. I went to the best MBA program. And, um, and here I am talking to a recruiter, trying to get a job that would have paid me, you know, maybe a third of what I was making previously. Um, I never thought, I thought, I never thought that I'd ever be able to make as much money as I was making in sales at Thomson Reuters. I almost thought they overpaid me, uh, to be honest with you. Like for what I was doing for them, did I really deserve to be paid this much? And now that I don't have that job, the world just felt like a really dark place. I, you know, thank, thank God Mike Gibbs was so understanding. I'm, I'm sitting here with these emails that I printed off just talking about how, how dark it felt and how limited the opportunities seemed to be. Um, I went to see career services and um, not just at the, at the school, but other career services people. And, and they all told me the same sort of stories and they all gave me the same sort of advice and none of it was particularly helpful or hopeful. It was all the same advice that career services across the land still give to, to graduates. And, um, and I, I followed that advice. You know, I, I opened myself up to other opportunities. I thought, okay, I could sell mutual funds in the, in the wholesale market to, uh, to broker dealers. I, I had all sorts of other ideas and I followed career services advice and I really worked hard at trying to get a job and nothing that was offered to me seemed to offer much hope. I could have been a financial advisor. I got a, an offer from JP Morgan Chase and, or I could have even sold for LexisNexis, which was Westlaw's competitor and made a fraction of what I was making at, at Thompson. Just none of them seemed like great opportunities. And so um, another guy who did what I did called me up and he said, hey, Rafi, why don't you come sell for me until you find something? And I said to Greg, why don't you give me half your company and we'll grow this together? Because he only started a few months earlier. And he said, you know what? You'd be a good partner. Let's do it. So um, I, first of all, I thought I was foreclosing a whole lot of other opportunities. Like if I start my own business, am I ever going to be able to go back and try to get any of these other jobs? And I'm looking at these emails that I was sending to Mike and I was really concerned about the opportunity cost of starting my own business. And I guess it was a concern, but um, I jumped right in and it turned out that my partner was never going to give me half his business, even though he just started it. So several months after that, I, I formally incorporated and, um, and went off entirely on my own. Okay. No, that's, uh, that's, that's actually, it's, it's interesting, right? I think as you, were, as you were speaking about, you know, sitting there getting opportunities that were a fraction of your income or, or struggling, right? Or working through some of that, right? I, I you know, I, I have uh, classmates on here that, that I know sitting down across the dinner table. Um, you know, in, in either in London or or at, in uh, at Bleacher and having the similar conversation where it's, okay, I've got this degree, right? But the economy is going down. Or I have classmates that I talk to right now that say, I need help with my resume, but what I'm getting is not where I want to go. And I think what, what's compelling about your, your story is there was a point in time where you kind of came to the realization that you had to jump off. You had to do the pivot. Right, and I think you've, you've brought us to that juncture really well. Now, one of the questions that, that I'm seeing coming through, and I had a, one, one person WhatsApp it to me, was in making the decision, right? What part of your booth education enhanced your 
thinking skills to say this is the right decision, right? What, what did that give you the confidence that you said, look, I've got this education, I've got these critical thinking skills, this is the way I want to go? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, certainly a lot of what I learned in Mike's classes um, helped. It's been so long that I can't tell you exactly what those things were. It was 11 years ago. But we had another professor. He was a PhD in sociology. I don't know if he still teaches at Booth. Um, but he talked a lot about networks. Do you guys, did you guys have that professor? By the way, Shamas, I can't see you. Do you mind flipping on your video? You betcha. Okay. You're talking about Ron Bird. Ron, Ron Bird. He That's teaches an elective. His, his elective used to be a required course yes. in the last quarter, in fact, right before graduation. Yes. So I don't know how many of you, thank you, Michael. So I don't know how many of you took that course, but Ron taught us a lot about networks and he taught us about bringing value. And um, I might be cannibalizing a little bit of my later presentation, but so be it. What he said was the people that get paid the most, the people that are valued the most, are people who can bring two different disciplines together. And, um, and, I, and I said to myself, where can I add the most value? I, I've got all this great education from Booth and I've got this legal background. I really understand lawyers, especially small law firms and especially personal injury lawyers and workers' compensation lawyers, but small law firms generally, I get what they do very well. How could I marry these two and offer a value proposition that would differentiate me from my competitors. And that's how I arrived at Market JD. I said, you know what? I, I thought about all these other opportunities, but what makes me any better than other people that are trying for those same jobs? And the answer is nothing. I should not be applying for those jobs because I wasn't the best candidate for that job. But for the job I was creating for myself to do legal marketing for lawyers, yeah, there weren't many people that were going to do it better than I could because they simply didn't have those skills and that knowledge. And the ability for me, I drew that conclusion from the lessons that I learned at the University of Chicago, from, from Bert, um, about networks and, and where to find value. Oh, that's, that's, that's actually great because I think, as I go back to one of the reasons we're doing this is, is essentially how we add value to the network. I think Ginzel, Linda Ginzel, and I don't know if people have seen it. It's the graph where she says, you, you contribute. It's how do, we, how do we not split up the value, but how do we increase the value of the interaction where both of us walk away as winners? And I think that's the, that's the thought process. Now, one of the things I think that, that I wanted to, you to touch on a little bit, right? So you didn't immediately losing your job, you didn't say, I'm going to start my own company. It took you, it took you a little while. Can you, can you share a little bit about that and how, how you handle that? Because in my conversations with you and Peter's conversations with you, right? We've walked away with, with an admiration for your zeal, right? Your passion, your positivity, you know, and I think that's important for us to, to understand at this time. Yeah. So um, I, I've always been a real believer in reading those books on positive mental attitude. Um, they, they may sound cheesy, but I think the most successful people in the world are incorporating the values that you find there. Um, when I, uh, when I first lost my job, it was about six months where I was searching for another job. At the time, there was a, um, there was a offshoot of the University of Chicago. Um, maybe Mike can re re remind me the name. They do securities research and um, they're a really respected uh, think tank. Uh, so Center for Research and Securities Prices. That's exactly it. And they had some extra space and, and they were generous enough to allow unemployed folks like me who are booth grads to use that space. So I would go there every day. I still have some friends from that I met there and they let me use their space and their printers and their, and their little phone booths so I could call employers. And, um, and I just made it my full-time job to look for a job. And, um, and it was one opportunity after another, but there was just nothing out there. It was like it is today. I mean, no, we were able to go to work, but there was no work to go to because everyone was losing their job. It was a total financial meltdown and nothing was working economically. The Federal Reserve kept trying to take actions that would rectify or improve it. And no matter what they did, it just got worse and worse. 
So it didn't matter how good of a, 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 um, an applicant I was, there were no jobs to, to be had. So um, this isn't the first time that I experienced this. When I graduated law school, I was lucky enough to graduate in 1994 when it was almost as bleak as 2008 and 2009. And I couldn't find a job then either. And, um, and so I started my own law firm then and, um, and eventually it worked out okay. Um, so I said, look, if I could do it once, I, I could do it again. What I couldn't afford is to not work because I had bills coming in, mouths to feed, and I was the only breadwinner. So I, I, I was gonna work at Starbucks if I had to, um, but I thought I could, I could probably do better than that. Um, so I, I just said, I don't have a choice. This is the best option is entrepreneurship. And what I'll say is taking action is so much better than not taking action. So I, you know, during those six months, I did a lot of soul searching. And yes, I went to the office every day. And yes, I was really actively looking for a job. But I was in a very bad pool of people. And by, by bad pool of people, I mean, I was seen as somebody who's unemployed and almost as somebody, you know, people felt sorry for. And I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. And I didn't need people to feel sorry for me because I knew inside that I had a lot to offer. They just didn't discover it yet. And if they weren't going to give me the job I wanted, I was going to create the job I wanted. And then when I have my own job and my own business, when I'm proactive, people will look at me differently. Then they're gonna say, okay, I don't feel sorry for that guy anymore. Now that guy has something I want, and now they're gonna pay me for it. And that's, that was my attitude. And, um, and I believed more in myself than anyone else did, obviously, because they weren't offering me the jobs, or maybe just the jobs weren't there. But at the end of the day, it really didn't matter. I needed to work, and that's what I did. No, that's, uh, I, I think that's, that's great advice. It's, it's, you know, you have to take action. Action, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, what Mike taught us in game theory, right? That's actually Mike. See, I'm using what you taught me. Game theory, right? What is the result of action? You actually get something, you have a result, and you'll know more. If you don't take action, you won't know more. Um, sorry, I'm trying to please Mike a little. <laughs> uh, you know, what, what did you... What did you... What did you... What did you, what did you what did your business graph look like, right? So, in, it, because it, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, the business, I'm, and, and maybe this is me being, uh, being a little uh, optimistic, the business took off immediately. Was it, did it go straight up or was the first year hard and then you had to, you had to build your leads uh, and then all of a sudden you had that, you had that uh, graph uh, going up, right? How did that first year go? How did you, um, how did you go get new clients? right? And, 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 and chase down those leads. Like, how did that look like? Would you be able to share that? Yeah, sure. Um, in my first year, I didn't have an office. Uh, my office was in my basement. Uh, my wife um, uh, generously allowed me to use a, probably a, a 50 foot storage closet in my office that had spider webs and was dark. And um, it was depressing. But um, but every day I would, I would work without exaggeration, 17 hour days. I remember literally falling asleep at my computer and drooling on myself and like waking up and saying, I got to go to bed. Um, and I would do this every day. And I, I, did, I didn't take a day off. I, I didn't take a day off for probably two or three years. I mean, I worked really hard. And in my first year, I made, I think, $30,000. And um, in my second year, I probably didn't make a lot more, maybe 50 or 60,000. Um, and I was just trying to figure it out because I was a one man show and I would hire a bunch of subcontractors to help me do the work. So at the time there was a platform called Upwork and, um, or is that what it's called now? It was called E, well, I can't even remember what it was called, but it was a platform where I could hire um, uh, subcontractors. And so I had to learn everything. I, I was competing against very established businesses. I was competing against Thomson Reuters. I was selling marketing against Thomson Reuters and other very established, very big players. And I was one guy and I had no resources. I had my computer and my suit and that was about it. 
and I had to create something from nothing. And I spent those first two years figuring it out, figuring out exactly what my product was going to be and how I was going to sell it. The advantage I had is I could pivot on a dime. A large company couldn't simply say that they were going to offer this new product tomorrow. They'd have to go through all sorts of processes and it would take them four months and committees and everything else. If I found something I liked, if I found something that would be useful to my client, then I would call them up on the phone and I'd tell them, hey, this, I've got this great idea. What do you think of this? Um, and even if it didn't work, they appreciated the fact that I thought about them and I was taking action on their behalf. And, um, and so, no, it didn't come literally at all. My first two years were just brutal. And then, you know, the next couple of years weren't easier. They were just more profitable. Um, it probably took me four or five years before I was able to reach the same heights of income that I was making before I left. Um, and, and so um, the five years after that were very good and made up for everything that I didn't make in the first five years. But um, now people, you know, look at my business and, uh, and they say, they, they kind of, they, they almost think it's easy to do what, what I did. And, and what they don't see is, is all of the effort that I had to put in in the first couple of years. It's, um, I always analogize it to a flywheel. Um, one of those exercise bikes that you get on with a flywheel in it, you start pushing and pushing and pushing, and it just doesn't get very far. And even though you're putting in all this effort, you just you have to keep putting in more and more. And eventually, and this is uh, from a book, From Good to Great, eventually that flywheel starts moving, and then it almost looks effortless. And that's what building a business is all about. You just have to really persevere because those initial pushes are going to be so hard and so not gratifying and so unprofitable, but necessary before you get to where you really want to be. And we, we, we have a, so I have, I have one more question and I'll turn it over to Peter, but before I ask my question, um, we did have a question that uh, one, of our, one of our participants um, asked, and, and, I, and, and um, I, think, I think you'll have great insight in this. Um, and one of the things, it ties back to one of uh, what you just said is, is this, uh, discipline, the doggedness that you have, and I don't know if doggedness, the perseverance that you have in pursuing business and pursuing clients. What does your typical client acquisition journey look like, right? How do you identify and, and sort of, and, and what I'm hearing is because you're small, it allows you to be agile. It allows you to pivot depending on what the client needs and, and be able to do a lot more than a large company would. Um, would you be able to share what your, what your journey looks like if you're acquiring new clients or signing new clients? Yeah, so I'm going to, um, again, I'm going to cannibalize on some of my uh, PowerPoint slides later. Um, so when I started, I thought that my market was every lawyer. And I would try to speak in front of any group that would listen to me, any group of lawyers. And I got in front of a lot of generalists. And they're the easiest to get in front of. And my success in selling to those people wasn't so good. I could sell to them, but they didn't have a lot of money. And, um, and over time, I realized that my marketplace is not small law firms. My marketplace is far narrower than that. My, my value is best consumed by the personal injury and workers' compensation lawyers because they have the greatest upside potential. And, um, and it took me about two years to come to that realization. So instead of going to the Chicago Bar Association, which is a very general organization, or the Clark County, which is a Nevada Bar Association where I spoke several times, I, I landed upon an opportunity to speak at the Nevada Justice Association. And that is the state's trial lawyers. Those are the PI and personal injury and workers' compensation lawyers. And that was when I came to the understanding that this is my target market because they are willing to pay a lot for what I'm selling. And that's one of the things um, I, would, I would strongly advise to you. If you're thinking of starting your own business, you need to become a specialist in a very narrow area. And you need to find a group of people that are already paying for those services and paying a lot. 
Don't try to create a new market. You're not going to do it. You're not going to persuade people unless you're, you're a very, very special person. You're generally not going to persuade people that they need a product that they're not already paying for. I think the easiest way to, to be successful is to find a business model that's already working for others. So for example, um, SAP, I haven't thought about this for so long. Um, when I was graduating, there were a ton of consultant companies that were able to implement SAP. They were small businesses and they'd be hired by large businesses like General Motors to come in and help them implement a part of SAP. Now, if you had a subspecialty, maybe you can do this for, um, maybe you knew about nuclear reactors and you can implement SAP for nuclear reactor companies. That was something that, that people would pay you for because that's not a skill a lot of people have. Um, so my skill was, um, I'm sort of losing my, my focus here. Oh, my customer acquisition. So once I realized that it was PI and workers' compensation lawyers, then I knew where my focus was. And my sales cycle was fairly long. Um, and that's part of the reason why it's hard to get into my business is the, the rewards are not quick. It took a long time for these lawyers to trust me. Um, uh, if I could pivot uh, now to the networking part of, of this, that's when I stopped networking with generalists. In fact, I would tell you that you should not be networking with most people in the world. That's when I stopped going to my general networking meetings. Um, and I did it for two reasons. One, when I go to these general networking meetings, there was always the expectation that I had to give something back. And that was fine. I don't mind giving back. I love giving back. But they had nothing to give me in return because they were not my prospective clients. So by going to the trial lawyer association meetings, by going to this trade group, I could give to them and they could give to me. And so um, I would tell you that you need to think carefully how you spend your time networking and with whom and be very strategic about it because that's this, I would say that's the single most important element in figuring out who your market is and going after it effectively. Thank, thank you, Rafi. Before I ask my last question, I, I have a proposal for you actually. A couple, of, uh, a couple of the participants are wondering if you'd be open to, uh, and I think they're serious, if you'd be open to doing uh, coaching for small businesses and sales. So um, I've asked them to reach out to you via LinkedIn. So you, will, you may get, uh, you may get uh, a, new, a new business, uh, something new, new, new going. So if you're open to that, I think a couple of folks will probably reach out, reach out to you via LinkedIn. Um, okay, I'm looking forward to yeah, and uh, and and my last uh, my last question before I turn it over to Peter, um, you know, you 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 are successful, right? Whether it's financially, I mean, in terms of where you are in your life, you achieve success with your business, right? With with pivoting, with uh, you you seem content, right? And and I've learned this, and you know, while this may be true for me, but it may not be true for you, success cannot be attributed to just one person, right? What do you attribute your success to? What helped you? Uh, achieve success? What factors, people, would you say were, were important to that? Yeah, it's interesting. I could, I could point to, to very specific people along the way that helped. Like, um, and I'm not just saying this to flatter him because he really stepped up when no one did. Uh, Mike was always there for me. Um, it was really a dark time. I was really uh, torn up and he always offered me hope. Uh, and I really needed that because he's the only professor that did. Um, and, and I really needed it. Uh, I, I can't um, tell you how much it meant to me at the time. Um, I remember literally walking into another lawyer's office, a friend of mine, in tears. And I don't cry easily. Um, and uh, he was a defense lawyer. And <laughs> he wasn't very compassionate about it. Um, and, uh, and then when I started my own business, I found people that wanted to help me. And it turns out that people, people are much more willing to help you when you're trying to help yourself. And so I went to some of the old clients that I had at Thomson Reuters. And I don't know if my, if my product at the time was as good as Thomson's, but they wanted to help me and they could tell that I really, I really cared. And um, one, of the, one of the things in my uh, presentation is um, a quote from uh, Roosevelt who said that uh, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And 
if you're in business for yourself, you better care about your clients deeply. Uh, and, and that's what helped me is they knew that I really cared about their business and I really wanted to help them. And in turn, they wanted to help me. So I have one client. It turns out that when I was in college and my last year of high school, I was a vendor at Wrigley Field. I used to sell Pepsi and uh, peanuts and hot dogs. And um, one of the guys that vended with me was Howard Ankin. Uh, for those of you in Chicago, you might know him. He's Ankin Law. And um, when we did that, I started a little side business selling light sticks at the fireworks um, on 4th of July. And I asked Howard if he wanted to sell for me because it was a great business and I can only be at one fireworks display at a time. And Howard said, yeah. And I set him up and he made a couple hundred dollars that day. And he did it over, I think, two days each firework um, season. And, uh, and he really loved me for it. Um, and so when I went out on my own, I called up Howard. And Howard returned the favor. And he became my biggest client. Uh, to this day, he's my biggest client. He's probably 10 or 15% of my revenue. Um, and he is a rock for me. He's, he's always there for me. He buys whatever I sell. He believes all my bullshit. Um, and, uh, and, and, and he, he's as confident in me as, as, um, sometimes more so than maybe than I am. And, um, and I've had other guys that are, you know, they really, they care about me and I care about them. I was up at 12 o'clock last night, excited to talk to a property tax lawyer about this campaign we're gonna do for him. And I thought to myself, I, I was patting myself on the back, I'm throwing modesty to the wind here, but I thought, you know what? This guy's not gonna leave me. There's no other marketer who's gonna be talking to him from 12 until one o'clock in the morning about something that I'm as excited about as he is. And that's the sort of, those are the sort of guys that have, that have, I attribute my success to them because they're there for me and I'm there for them. And no amount of, um, no sales pitch, no marketing effort that my competitors are going to come up with are going to take this client away from me. Um, and I have, look, I'm only, I'm still a small business. I only have maybe 20, 25 people working for me and I don't have the resources of some of my competitors, but they're not going to take my clients away. I've got a good 25 high paying clients. Um, and I don't, you get a lot of them often. I grow a few every year, but each one of them contributes a lot to my bottom line. And, um, and that's my business model. That's how I differentiate myself is I am there for them. They, I become part of their team and I, I give them a part of my heart. You know, um, I'm going to take over, Shamus, if that's okay. It's, uh, we'll, we'll do the last segment. Um, actually, when we were speaking, one of the, the most impressive things that you did for me, uh, Rafi, was to talk through um, these uh, minimal action items that I could do uh, automatically to start getting momentum in my own direction. Um, for example, one of the great suggestions you provided was to write a uh, piece on the blog every day. I'm doing it every two days. I got two up on LinkedIn already. And you talked to me about also funnel approach and sales and thinking about, you know, what my offer points are. So um, I don't know if you have that on your slides and whether you want to share it, but uh, those action items were, I found extremely uh, helpful and also inspiring. So. Okay, so um, I'm going to go a little bit off script here and then I'm going to share my, uh, my PowerPoint. Um, at the moment, I'm... I'm sort of fascinated with and enrolled in this, uh, let's see if I have it here. Uh, yeah, it's called the One Funnel Challenge. Um, and the, the guy's name is Russell Brunson, B-R-U-N-S-O-N. And he has a product called ClickFunnels, C-L-I-C-K-F-U-N-N-E-L-S. And um, Russell, Russell has taken this concept of a marketing funnel and he's married it with direct sales. So I don't know if, how many of you from, uh, that weren't raised in the United States are familiar with the late night TV ads, but in the United States, we have these ads that come on and they're always the same format. Like they might be selling this Shamu sponge, um, for $9.99 that does these miraculous things to your car. You know, you can clean your car in two minutes and it'll have an everlasting shine and 
they make all these promises and it's only 9.99 and if you act now you can buy one and get one for free just pay the shipping and handling and um and these these sales pitches are great for consumer products because they've tapped into something called neurolinguistic programming and neurolinguistic programming essentially has broken down the psychological elements that people use before they buy and Brunson has taken this and he's married it to the internet and he's came up he's come up with a framework for helping people sell anything in the world any product or service no exception and um, his overall construct consists of three three elements hook story and offer the hook is is something that arouses people's curiosity it gives them a reason to want to talk more with you the story tells them the why it tells them how you're able to deliver on that hook and the offer is buy now or get more or read more or talk to us now so now I'm really going to cannibalize my PowerPoint. So some of this will be repetitive, but you asked. So here I go. Um, a lot of people, including myself, graduate from Booth with this shiny new MBA. What does an MBA run these days, by the way? 150? 130? I don't know. When uh, I graduate, it it I kind of runs yeah, closer to 200. Yeah. For tuition? 180, 180 about. Yep. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's literally 50% more than I paid. I, mine was 120. And I thought that spanking new MBA. Ralphie, was, you buy one, we'll give you one free. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I thought that that sparkling new MBA was going to be the path to my success. That when people saw my background, I'm a lawyer, I litigated. I've got sales experience. I worked for a Fortune 500 company, and now I've got an MBA from the University of Chicago. Who wouldn't want to hire Rafi Arbel? Boy, was I mistaken. My MBA, my law degree, and everything else that I would like to talk about, and $3 would get me a ride on the CTA. No one cared about my MBA. No one cares that it's from the University of Chicago. And that was really disheartening because I invested everything into that MBA. I really worked hard. I graduated cum laude, not because I'm so smart, because I just worked really hard at it and I thought people would be impressed. And they maybe were impressed, but I didn't get a job out of it. What people are willing to pay for are solutions. You need to be able to address somebody's problem. And if you can address somebody's problem, then they'll pay you all the money in the world. But they're not gonna pay you just to be smart or have a degree. And that's when I stopped telling people that I've got a U of C MBA right off the bat. In fact, I didn't even tell them I was a lawyer and I was selling to lawyers. I wanted them to know that I could solve their problem and the way that I speak, the way I frame the issues, the way that I frame the marketplace and give them an understanding of what they need to do, well, they would figure out that I was a U of C MBA because it doesn't matter that I have the, the diploma. It matters that I have the knowledge and how I use that knowledge and help them. That's what getting the MBA is about, is how you can help other people. If your business model isn't about helping other people, you've got the wrong model. What was the question again? By the way, that, that's an awesome answer. Sorry, Peter. I, if you're, if you're... No, no, that was, exactly, that was the, exactly the answer to my question about you know, um, what were the inspiring points um, you talked about the funnels and you also talked about you know what proactive steps I should be taking now and and uh, um, you oh, address that I, question. I'm sorry if I could just add one more thing. Yes. So <laughs> why where is that MBA relevant? So the hook is the benefit you're gonna give them. So you know I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to help a lawyer get new clients. Why am I but everyone says that to the lawyer. Everyone comes to the lawyer's office and says, I can help you get new clients. Write me a check for $50,000. So why should they do business with me? Ah, now we're getting to the reason why my MBA is important. 
well, yes, right, we're both gonna, saying that we're going to get you new clients, but only one of us is a lawyer, and only one of us has an MBA, and only one of us has an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Well, now, that's a feature. That's a feature of who I am. One of the features is that I have an MBA from Booth. And that does differentiate my, that does differentiate me, but that's not the problem I'm solving. That's the reason why I'm able to solve the problem better than others. It's, but it's not the benefit. Um, did you want to share your slides or? Yeah, um, let's do that. We'll okay. run through it quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You want to give some context, Peter, so people understand, because Rafi actually put in a lot of time. Uh, Rafi's got some techniques, some strategies that, uh, that he's been using. Yeah, I haven't seen the slides, so sorry, Shamas. Go ahead. Yes. And so he wanted he wanted to share, um, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, his experience, what strategies, um, how to package yourself, how to build your brand, um, which I think is very very important, and and how to build that credibility and make yourself successful. So you know, thank you, Rafi, for doing this. I think I think this is great. And Rafi, as as I've said, there's going to be people probably reaching out to you on LinkedIn to get some coaching. Um, you know, and, and I think as part of our unspoken agreement that I had in my head, that if you make any money out of this, I get 50% of it. <laughs> uh, he, he, he can't be getting the 15% because I get a cut of his 50. So then we'll give a kickback to Mike anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, all yours. So, Ref. Are you Sorry. able to see my notes or are you able to see the slide? Uh, yeah, we can see the slide. The yeah, okay. And Rafi, you'll share this deck, right? That we can we can share with people if that's okay with you. Uh, yeah, I don't know how useful it'll be, but yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, because I, I know somebody's going to ask me. So okay, so um, this is my family, and uh, the reason I put this picture on here is that this was in 2010, the summer of 2010, and I committed to my family that every year we were going to take a one-week summer vacation. And I had no money to go anywhere fancy. So we, we got in our, our uh, minivan and uh, we drove to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And this is uh, Taquanamon Falls. Um, I think the most expensive hotel that was in any of these towns was probably $80. Um, and we just said, you know what? These are hard times, but we're gonna make the most of it. And, uh, and, and we did, and we had a great time. It was a great, great trip. and. Um, uh, and, you know, they say that success is about the journey. It's not about the destination. And this was a hard chapter and a hard part of the journey, but uh, it, it, it will turn out all right. It turned out all right for me and it, and it will turn out all right for you. Um, I can't tell you how many businesses go under because they don't believe in themselves. Um, I don't know what the stats are, but I'm sure you all, you've all heard about all the businesses that fail. You have to have a certainty about you. You genuinely have to have a deep belief that you'll succeed. When I was in operations class, the same operations class I'm sure you guys took, did you guys do that simulation? Littlefield, yes. yes. Littlefield. So I was in a group with three or four other guys and one of them was a CPA and he was also a consultant. And there was a problem, I can't remember what it is anymore. And I had a solution to the problem and the CPA had another solution to the problem. And we had to decide whose solution we were going to, uh, to use. And they were two absolutely different choices. And the group got on a conference call and they heard me present my solution and they heard Bill Hardin present his solution. And I told them exactly step by step by step why my solution was right. And this went down for an hour. And I went through detail by detail by detail. And Hardin went through his presentation explaining why he was right. And the group bought into my solution because of course I was right until the answers came back and I was wrong. Hardin was right. But I believed in myself so much that I persuaded everyone in the group I was right. And these were no dummies. These were all critical thinkers. And yet, because I was so certain in my beliefs, I was able to persuade them that, that my answer, the wrong answer, was the solution they should go through. And um, it's that certainty that does a lot of good for me. Now, it doesn't, 
I come across as a little heavy handed. That's just my personality and I'm, I'm somewhat forceful. But there are a lot of people that can be certain, but it's a much more quiet certainty. It's a much more introverted certainty, but it's a certainty nonetheless. They know they're right. And even if they're not right, they don't ever let you know it because they believe they're right and they believe their solution is the one that you should have. That's what you need. And um, in, this, in the background of the slide, uh, I don't know if any of you can recognize him, it's not easy to see with the words over it, but that's Jonas Salk. And Jonas Salk came out with the polio vaccine and they thought he was crazy. Polio was devastating the world. It was crippling people all over the place. And this guy, Jonas Salk, came out with a vaccine. The whole idea behind the, this vaccine that the entire scientific community doubted. And he was so sure of himself, he gave himself and the family this deadened polio uh, virus. Who would give that to their children? And he did. And that's what eradicated polio. He showed that this vaccine was going to work. And now we don't have a polio problem because of Jonas Salk and his certainty and his beliefs. And by the way, let me tell you something. On the outside, I look very confident, but I have the same doubts that everybody else does. I'm too small of a player. I don't have the resources. I'm not as creative. I'm not as smart. I'm not as charismatic. And whenever that creeping voice comes in, I just tell it to shut up and I just start doing. I just start taking actions. I just start moving forward. And I've got other classmates. I've got another classmate that worked for um, Price Waterhouse and he went off on his own. And I think he would have been very successful. But about a year into it, he gave up and he went back to his old consulting company where you know he's probably making good money. I don't blame him for doing it. But that's not the certainty. You need more certainty than that. You need to understand that this isn't gonna happen in a year Year one, I made $30,000. In year two, I probably only made 50,000. And I bounced a couple of checks and I incurred a lot of fees. But I knew that in the end, I was gonna succeed. And that's what you need. I know a lot of successful millionaires, self-made millionaires. A lot of my friends have done it. And none of them did it overnight. It all came after a lot of hard work and many years of investing in their businesses. So let's go on to the next slide. You need to, you really need to control. It's you in control, Rafi, if you want to move to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Have I not yeah. moved down? Okay, hold on Yeah, you have to. Uh, can you not see the second slide? Let's see. No, for some reason it's not. Maybe uh, you need to play through or something. It doesn't say own your destiny on the slide you're looking at? No, it just says hello. Oh, uh, all right. Let me see if I can. Rafi, if you're using a clicker, it won't work with Zoom. You have to use your keyboard. All right, when, me, when you're sharing your screen. Uh, okay, let me see. Let me pause this and maybe I'll get out of that. All right, are you able to, what are you able to see? There you now? go, own your destiny. Okay, so um, you're probably seeing my notes as well, but uh, so be it. Um, you can scroll them down a little bit or yeah, drop them down, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, okay, so. Uh, we trust your notes. Okay. <laughs> so um, look, the, the traditional narrative that you hear from so many people, uh, career services especially, is, you know, get your resume done, write a great cover letter and go network and just send it out to a lot of people and call people on the phone and see if you can get meetings. You know the story. We've been told this for, for decades and that's what ordinary people do. And if you do what ordinary people do, you're gonna get ordinary results. Like, yes, based on your education and your experience, you're gonna get the ordinary results of somebody with your education and experience who takes ordinary actions. And those things are all ordinary. Whenever I hire, I get a ton of resumes. It's really hard to figure out who the right applicant is. But when I get a resume that's uniquely formatted and gives me really cool visuals to understand who they are and what they do, that stands out a little bit. Um, I mean, they need to stand out more than just that, but even that one little element is something that, that helps them stand out. Here's something I'd suggest you do, and this is gonna be later in the presentation, but I'm gonna give it to you now. You really wanna stand out? Get yourself a website. 
go to squarespace.com or Wix or any of those other places um, that do websites. I was actually thinking of creating a website for, for folks in this position, but then I found Squarespace and I would have to charge way more than they're charging. So you might as well go to Squarespace. They've got these beautiful resumes for people. Maybe it's 50 bucks a month and you have a space on the internet that you can call your own. And that's where you develop your brand. Um, let's see here, own your destiny, here we go. Uh, I'm really skipping ahead here. Um, let me go to the next slide. The very first thing you need to decide is if you're gonna be an employee or a business owner. Um, I think that be, being an employee uh, is not nearly as profitable or satisfying as being a business owner, but it's a lifestyle choice. It's really intense. It's all consuming owning your own business. But for many of you, you're intense people anyway. You're hardworking, you're putting in long hours, and you're not afraid to, to make it a career, not just a job. If you're going to do that, why not own a production? Oh, I'm getting a little bit of an um, echo. Is somebody's uh, mic on? Um, if your mic is on, we turn it off. Thanks. Um, if, you, uh, if you're going to put in that kind of commitment, if you're going to work hard and you're willing to take a little risk, I think you're far better off starting your own business than working for somebody else. But that's probably partially as a result of my personality. It's not every personality that likes owning their own business. Either way, whether you're an employee or you own your own business, you need to establish your brand. And when I say your brand, I'm not talking about a logo or your colors. That's very surfacy. A brand is who you are and what you're going to contribute to the world how you're gonna add value. What problems are you gonna solve? Your logo and the colors, that's just a physical representation of everything else. You really need to figure out who you are and what you're gonna offer the world as an employee or as a business owner. Find a niche. Let me ask you this. Who's going to earn more money? Trump, I, you need to click on the side slide, I think, or somehow it's not scrolling through, Rafi. Oh. Sorry. Okay. So the slide says find a niche. Can you not see okay. that? Uh, we can see it only in the side uh, panel. Oh, okay. panel. let me see if I can do, hit present. Um, present. Rafi, do, are you using two monitors? No, I'm just using one. Uh, yeah, there you go. Now we can see find a niche. Okay. So I can't see my notes, but that's okay. I don't really need them. Um, so, you know, who are you going to pay more money to? Are you going to pay more money when you go to see your general family practitioner? Or are you going to get a much bigger bill when you go to see your pediatric oncologist? Obviously the latter. You need to find your niche. And in finding your niche, I think it helps to, um, you know, there's a book I want to recommend to you. I'm sorry to go off on a tangent. It's called Expert Secrets by Russell Brunson. He's the guy from ClickFunnels. Keep in mind, this is a guy that never graduated college and I'm recommending his book because it's really good. You could find it on eBay. You could download the PDF for $2. So you don't need to buy the hard copy. And um, uh, he goes over some of the things that I do and he offers a nice blueprint. You'll, you'll hear a lot of the themes um, repeated. But um, one of the things he talks about, and I've heard this before, is every business can be categorized in three, one of three different buckets. It either deals with health, wealth, or relationships. So you, gotta, you obviously have to pick one of those categories. Mine's obviously dealing with wealth. I'm helping people make more money. Within any one of those categories, there are subcategories. So uh, within wealth, there's marketing. Um, and then within each subcategory, there are niches. And my niche is internet marketing, but my niche is even more specialized than internet marketing. Mine is internet marketing for lawyers. And I would argue mine is even more specialized than that. It's more personalized internet marketing for lawyers. And the more of a sub niche that you could carve out, the more you can charge if you find the right group. And it's no different between my, my business and the pediatric oncologist. Both of us are finding a sub-niche. We're getting trained for that sub-niche and we're exploiting it. All right, let me go on to the next slide. All right, the next slide is no one but your mother 
uh, cares about your fancy MBA. Um, and I think we sort of, um, I'm sort of beating a, a dead horse on this. Um, it is a feature of who you are, but it doesn't define who you are or what you have to offer. That's what your homework is, is in 30 seconds to tell somebody the benefit. Find your hook. Why should I talk more about you? What can you do for me? That's what people want to know. And then you could tell them about your MBA as the reason why you can do it, as one of many reasons, but a very important reason. All right, let's go to the next one. And that dovetails into what I was telling you about with Theodore Roosevelt. No one cares how much you know until you, they know how much you care. We already covered that one. Um, this one, I, I love this quote. Dale Carnegie, I've been reading since I was a boy. When I was uh, in high school, my dad gave me his book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People and uh, Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude, which is W. Clement Stone. That was actually the first positive mental attitude book I read. My dad was a cardiologist at Illinois Masonic, and um, that's a hospital that W. Clement Stone donated hundreds of millions of dollars to, and all of the doctors got his book. And probably like most other doctors, my dad put it on his bookshelf. And I wasn't much of a reader as a kid, but one day, for whatever reason, I went downstairs and I was bored in the summer and I picked up this book and I, and I couldn't put it down. I loved it. Everything they said spoke to me. And, um, and I would strongly advise reading some of these books. And that's the one I started with is Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude um, and uh, uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. These are classic wealth building novels. They give you the, 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 the blueprint for creating wealth. And one of the things Dale Carnegie talks about is inaction breeds doubt and fear. Action brings confidence and courage. This is what I'm telling you. If you've got those doubts inside, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not wealthy enough. I don't have the resources. Whatever your fear is, just start taking action. And when you do, you'll get incredible confidence from it. We'll go to the next slide. Um, that's the proactive slide. Um, Okay, here's a very concrete suggestion I could give you. Um, go to business.google.com and claim your Google. This is, a, this is Google's, back in the day when I was a kid, we all got yellow pages delivered to our door. And the yellow pages had all the businesses and their phone numbers. And if they took out an ad, there was an ad. Today, that's been replaced by Google My Business. And Google My Business is the entree point for businesses or individuals to register themselves. It's like taking out a listing in the yellow pages. Every professional should have a Google My Business account. For us, it's our business, it's our market JD uh, business account on Google My Business. But you as an individual, in establishing your brand, in establishing who you are and what your business proposition to the world is, needs to have a Google My Business profile. So go to Google My Business, it's business.google.com, and sign up for your, your individual profile. Don't even talk to, if, if you're reaching out to me on LinkedIn and you haven't done your Google My Business profile, I'm not gonna respond, because I'm gonna first go look for that. It is that important. And um, it gives you an avenue to the rest of the world. Now, where does this information get found? When somebody does a search on Google, you oftentimes find a map section at the top. It pulls their information for that map section from the local listings, from the Google My Business listing. So I, I can't emphasize that enough. And when you tie that into your one page website, by the way, the website should not only be one page, it should also have a blog attached to it. And we're gonna get to that in a minute. Um, hold on, let's go to the next one. Okay, this is my last slide, and this is going to be the longest slide. If you do these three things, I guarantee you, you're going to succeed. I told this to Peter, and I tell it to anyone who's willing to listen. Number one, after you get your blog, 
you need to publish every day for one year. Now, you can take shortcuts. You can do it three times a week. You can do it five times a week. But I'm telling you, if you do it every day for a year, you are going to accelerate your results in a way that nothing else will do. What do I mean by publish? Well, you've got to figure out what your brand is, first of all. So if, if you figured that out, then you publish about whatever it is that you're a subject matter expert in. I'm a subject matter expert in internet marketing for lawyers. So every day I should be publishing. I don't. I'm going to try soon. This is my goal. Um, I'm going to start publishing a video every day. I've already recorded a few videos. I just haven't put them on my YouTube uh, channel yet because I'm working on that. But I've started the videos. Every day you publish. And when you do that, three things will magically happen. One, perhaps the most important, is you're going to find your voice. You're going you're gonna to figure out what it is specifically that you're offering your clients. You're going to develop as a person. You're going to learn the issues that are important. And you're, more importantly, you're going to learn how to present those issues to other people. And in doing so, you're going to help other people. Because these videos shouldn't just be esoteric. They should be a genuine attempt by you to help the very people that you're trying to sell to. I was talking to that property lawyer last night. And I said, Gary, nobody is doing this. Nobody is doing what we're proposing to do right now. And he said, you know why, Rafi? Because everyone's scared to give away their secrets. And I said, Gary, you and I can sit down every day for a year and we can record in great detail everything that you do, every one of your secrets. And not only won't it hurt you, it will help your business. Because people aren't, they don't have his experience and they're not gonna learn to be a property tax appeals lawyer. Giving away all that inf information for free just helps instill trust that he's the guy that's for them because he really knows this stuff and he's trying to help you every way he can. And it develops a relationship. So that's number one. It, it helps you find your voice by publishing every day. Number two, if you do this for a year, you will never have to worry about money again because you will have so ensconced yourself in the marketplace and you will have done the, very, the, very, the third thing that this is going to do is it's going to help you gather. Maybe another word for gather is you need to develop your own audience, your own community. When I say that you need to offer value to people, one of the things that you can do for your prospective clients is offer them a community. So I would suggest that you start a Facebook group. It's a very specific thing, a Facebook group. And you need to learn about it. I can't tell you about it now because I've already probably overextended my time. But you should start a Facebook group. And you should do everything you can, including even perhaps paid advertising, to bring people into that Facebook group. Now, in that Facebook group, you're going to publish all of those YouTube uh, videos or all of your blog posts or all of your podcasts. When I say publish, there are three things you can do to publish. You can do a YouTube video if you like, if you think you're okay in front of a camera and everyone's okay. Look, no one likes to hear themselves talk. I've got a nasally voice and I can't stand looking at myself on the camera, but I'm doing it anyway. And if I can do it, you can do it. But if you really can't, then you could write blog posts. And if you really don't want to do blog posts, you can do a podcast where they don't see you, they only hear you. But whatever the case, you do those three things and then you, you take the link and you share it with your audience in your Facebook group. After 365 days, you're going to grow that Facebook group. Now, you're going to also have to promote it. You're going to have to go to other places where your prospective clients are and you're going to have to share your information. But you're going to have 365 days worth of information to share. And so you will build a huge group of people, a huge Facebook group, if you're publishing every day and you're sharing with other people. Now, the targeting network, that, the reason I didn't just put network is I don't want you networking with people that can't help you. It sounds selfish, but we only have 24 hours in a, in a day and you got to sleep at least five hours. So for the other 19 hours a day, you need to spend that 
where you're going to get the greatest return on your investment. So don't join networking groups where it's just a bunch of generalists. Join trade groups where your prospective clients hang out and find groups where they hang out online and join those communities and then encourage them to join your, your particular network, your Facebook group. So for me, it could be, you know, um, internet marketing for lawyers support group. Um, for you, it could be supply chain, um, supply chain engineer support group, or, you know, you come up with the name. I don't know what the name is, but it's going to be relative to what your brand is and the people you're trying to help. So if you do those three things, it's a very concrete, easy to follow game plan. In one year, you're going to have a very successful business. And you're going to be giving this, this presentation to the next XP class instead of me. That's about all I got. Rafi, uh, thank you so much. I mean, um, first I want to step back and thank Mike Gibbs for introducing us to you that, and, and for his support, right? He's done the same for me that he did for you. Um, and I hope he keeps doing it. <laughs> but no, truly, thank you. It was a wonderful presentation. I don't know, Shamans, if you have anything to add, but I, I just want to genuinely thank you for the time you took. It's a, a whole hour and a half. Uh, really, really grateful. And um, uh, if we can follow up, we'll, we told people to follow up with you on LinkedIn. Uh, and if there are any follow up questions, we'll reach out. Uh, Shamans, do you want to take us out? Yeah, so, um, so thank you, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, before folks, uh, folks exit, I did wanna go back and really kind of plug in our, our next, uh, next uh, set of uh, webinars that are coming up. So we have one on Thursday um, you know, with, with Sean, Sean Bimani, Dr. Sean Bimani. Uh, for those of us that were um, EXP 24 and AXP uh, 18, um, you know, oh, somebody remembers us. Um, Sean, um, Sean was the TA uh, for both the classes and he did a great job working with Nicole um, on, uh, on this. And so he now teaches at Northeastern University. He's actually been doing a lot of research on this disruption to the supply chain. And what he's going to walk us through is what, you know, and, and you know, there was a, a very good uh, discussion yesterday with uh, Raghuram Rajan uh, that Hal Weitzman um, facilitated and, and that's going to be on the Harper lecture side, if people want to go log in and look at that, but that's uh, that's what, uh, you know uh, tying onto that. Sean's going to talk a little bit more about what impacts are happening to the supply chains, where the opportunities are, where somebody can pivot to, uh, and, and and establish themselves as as uh, Rafi was alluding to, to the niche within that supply chain where they can make themselves valuable. So I think that's what uh, Sean's going to sort of walk us through. And then for those of us that remember, there was a, there's a, a, an executive coaching company that Booth uses um, called the Eye Opener Institute. And uh, what we've asked them to do is they're actually going to post uh, on the WhatsApp group in the next couple of days with an outline of what they're hoping to present. And they're going to ask for input on what questions you would like to get answered. So they're going to try and address that on Saturday um, as well. And we're doing it Saturday morning from 1030 to 1130 noon to allow um, folks from EXP, to allow some folks from India that asked if, if, they can, uh, if they can join. So those are the two things that we have lined up. Uh, we're gonna be talking to career services to see how they can come and participate and support us and provide more support, um, as well as uh, a couple of other people that we're thinking over the next couple of weeks. After that, I'm gonna run out of people that I know. So you know, if you have people that you know, if you wanna present, let us know so we can we can keep this going because I think I think this is a powerful way to to do things and I think I think we learned a lot and Rafi, I'm walking away with a, with a lot of good thoughts and and thank you so much uh, both to you to to Mike uh, Peter thank you for being a, uh, being a partner in this a anything else Peter or we can adjourn yeah I just wanted to I I posted on the side I would want to uh, welcome others on this uh, chat or otherwise to please join us in organizing these events as as we just saw from Rafi is extremely valuable and uh, I'm walking away with action items I don't think I'll sleep tonight just implementing everything Rafi suggested so thank you so much thank you all I appreciate your time oh thank you Rafi thank you thank you so much Rafi Shamis and Peter Thanks, Lavani. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Talk to you on Thursday.